Hello. So maybe I'm being optimistic when I say people might actually use this. But I'm hoping that perhaps if we focus on the people side of things, that maybe we will get things that we can use. First, I'm going to start with some assertions, because I don't have very long. And I want to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page. I don't necessarily work in this space specifically. And so I want to make sure you know where I'm at. One, today's technology forms much of our social and labor infrastructure. I mean, if you think about how much technology has become interwoven in our lives in the last 20 years or so, I mean, it affects everything we do. We, it affects how we communicate with each other. It affects how we get work. It affects what we do at work. It affects how we do that work. It affects the things that we have around our homes. It's everything. It is in everything. Two, the current mainstream technology has the business model of surveillance capitalism. So just like Yuta mentioned before, this is what everyone is doing to make money in technology. If you are not, you are the exception. By surveillance capitalism, I mean that people's information, personal information, their data, is being mined and exploited for financial gain. Three, technology inherits the biases of its creators. So that could be your racism, your homophobia, your transphobia, your ableism, your misogyny. If you hold particular views, you are going to write those views into everything that you do. You can't help it. It's not necessarily conscious, but it should be something we're broadly trying to avoid because what it does is it makes technology that does not serve everyone. In fact, it makes technology that often exploits people. And because of all of those previous things, of course, technology has a huge impact on society and democracy. These are systemic issues. So these are things that are, have become inherent to us as people, as humans. And we can't pretend that technology can fix issues with people, because it can't. No matter how good it is, no matter how well you've thought it through, you're not going to solve problems with humans. But what we can do is we can build ethical alternatives to mainstream technology. We can give people the choice. So if there are things out there that exploit you, and there's a lot out there that exploits you, we can give people the alternatives that are not going to exploit them. This is not going to be easy. Because to make something that's better than that exploitative tech, we have to really actively reject the status quo. You have to think about everything you've been told about how you live your lives, how you run your careers, what kind of development methodologies you use, uh, which servers you use, um, where you host stuff. Everything that you do, you have to question it. Because actually, at the very core of most of these things is someone who is not very nice making a lot of money from your decisions. And you have to try to take that away from them and give power to yourself and to the people using your products. We have to also continually challenge our own work. We have to ask these difficult questions about what we're doing. We have to listen to criticism and take it on board because we are not going to create anything better if we're walking around going, la, 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 it doesn't matter, I'm better than that. We're not. We've got to accept it. We've got to learn how to be better. So what is wrong <laughs> with today's decentralized technology? So I've been doing a bit of like listening to things today, a little bit of research and things like that, to see what I think might be particular to this community. But I mean also to the decentralized technology area I work in in general. I haven't got notes on my slides, so I've written them on my hand. Uh, number one, diversity. Because there are lots of very lovely people here today, but you have to admit that a lot of you are quite similar, maybe come from quite similar backgrounds and have quite similar amount of privilege. One of the things that generally blockchain has a very bad rep for, whether it's fair or not, 
is also the priority of making money over actually doing things for people. And I think that broadly this community seems to have an intent to do social good. So I think you have to work really hard to prove that is the case. Environmental problems. Because we have to make sure that the value that we are creating is greater than the potential damage we might cause. Oh yeah, that little thing called elitism that was mentioned on the panel this morning. We need to make sure that when we are doing decentralization, we are actually genuinely decentralizing power. We are not just putting power in the hands of the people who are building the technology and making the decisions about how it works. And the development of style over substance. Because it's very easy to say, I'm better than these competitors. It's easy to brand yourself and look cool and look like you're doing a good thing. You don't necessarily have to be doing the work behind it. And we need to see that and call those things out. So when we start off designing our product, like thinking about what are we actually going to do? What is this project? We start with our intent. This is the idea that we have. You could consider this as being like the food inside a seed, the stuff that allows that seed to grow, the stuff that's the fuel behind it, because we have to know what we're actually doing before we start doing it. So when we think about what we're building, I've got a little list here. This is where I keep notes all over the place. So we're building things like organizations, tools, currencies, more specific things like management systems and things like that. What are all these things for? Well, they're all for people. It's actual people that are going to be using it at the end of the day if we succeed. So we have to make sure, we have to design these things and build these things like someone might actually use it. There's no point going, oh, yeah, we'll deal with the, the person side of it later. We're just focusing on the infrastructure for now. What's the point? You might build the infrastructure in a way that is completely pointless and irrelevant for the people. The funding model. This is incredibly important because where we get our funding from and how we fund it, what our business models are, what our funding models are, affect what we build. Because it's the only way we can sustain a project is if we've got something coming in to fuel that. That is the seed. The seed of the fruit is the funding model. Because that is the only way it's going to grow. And that's why where the funding actually comes from is so important. Who have you sold your soul to in order to fund what you're building? Are you having to build it in a way that ensures growth, fast growth, exits, things like that? Are we building it in a way that means that you feel indebted to a particular framework, that you feel indebted to a particular sponsor? You are unlikely to criticize them in the future. You get stuck to them because you've always been with them. Because we don't have to just avoid building harmful technology. We have to actively work to build something positive. So this is one of the reasons why we made the Ethical Design Manifesto, me and Aral Bolkar, my partner at Indy. Because we wanted a kind of framework to help us understand when we're designing things, how do we do this right? So we're starting with the seeds of our fruit. So we've got them. That's the fruit. Then we can start looking at what makes up the core of the fruit. What is the most important aspect of our product and our project in order to ensure that it's ethical? Well, one, obviously, we have to make it decentralized. I don't need to explain decentralization to you lot, particularly. Um, but we're ensuring that we're decentralizing power as well as trust. And when it comes to trying to create an alternative to systems like surveillance capitalism, we're particularly needing to ensure that we're able to own our own data as the people who use products. Not storing data in one central location is the bare minimum of it. Once we've got that, we want to make these products inclusive. 
What is the point in building something if people can't use it? And who is most vulnerable to unethical technology? Well, it's marginalized people. Not necessarily situations that we're in ourselves, some of us might be, but it's always the people who have the least, who have the least privilege, that will suffer first. So we've got to make sure that things are inclusive, that they're designed for the needs of our diverse population, that our design is accommodating of what people need, and it doesn't discriminate against them. And one of the ways of doing this is ensuring that things are accessible to disabled people. One of the ways to think about this, how do we make things easy for everyone to use, and in particularly disabled people, make it easy to see. Can someone see your product? If they're blind, how do they interact with it? If they have eyesight loss, how do they interact with it? Make it easy to hear. If someone's deaf, how do they interact with your product? What if they have forgotten their earphones and they're sitting in, in a busy, loud room? What if they're sitting in a library? They don't want to disturb people. How do we make it easy to operate? So how do we make it so that people can interact with what we're building? Perhaps if they're not using the standard technologies we might use, what if they're not using a mouse? What if they're not using a keyboard? What if they're not using a touch screen? What if they're using a switch to control things? What if they're using eye tracking to control things? And make it easy to understand. What is the point in what we're building? Why should people want to use it? And how do we let them know how to use it in a way that really helps them? We need to accommodate disability and things like stress and distraction. Because let's face it, not everyone is using our products with the, the sort of dedication that we are. So when we're testing stuff, oh, we're looking at that gorgeous design. Yeah, oh, we know exactly what button to press. What if someone is using your product in stress or in danger or is in a rush? What if someone is just kind of idly looking at it while they've got the TV on in the background? We need to make products that are sustainable, both in an economic way and an environmental way. We want to make it that it's worth us investing all our time and resources in, but it's worth people who are using it to invest their time and resources in it. What's the point in investing your time in using a new product that's supposed to help you if it's just going to disappear next week? And we've seen that happen a lot over the history of the internet. We need to make things private, truly private. We need to enable people to choose what they share with others. We need to encrypt data so that no one else can access it. We need to make sure that we know giving people the option to sell their own data is not privacy, because consent is impossible. If you don't know, what that data says about you, you cannot possibly consent, you do not have the understanding of what it does, in order to be able to provide your consent. So I might think, oh, my location data from last week, I don't know, last Tuesday night, that's fine, don't, doesn't matter if someone sees that. But then what happens when you combine that with other data sets? What happens when now you know who I was sleeping next to last Tuesday night? What happens when, you now, when there's a crime that happens in my area? We can't possibly consent when we do not know the value of our data, particularly when combined with other data sets. We need to make sure the things we build are secure, which I think is fairly obvious, <laughs> protecting our data. is something that you lot focus on a lot. We need to make sure that the things we build are free and open. It offers so many advantages. Building freedom technology so that others can see the code we've written. They can see that they can trust it, or that they can't trust it. And if they can't trust it, they can fork it. Or if we lose interest and we go move on to a different project, someone else can fork it. Someone else can use it. The people who've invested the time and resources into it don't have to abandon it completely. We need to make things that are interoperable for those similar reasons, and no lock-in. Once we have all of these things together, all of these elements, 
that's when we're thinking about respecting human rights. We need to respect and protect people's civil liberties. This is a great tweet from last week. Compromise is the art of further marginalizing minorities to preserve the status quo, said Sarah Jamie Lewis. Every time you think this is a trade-off, think who is affected by that trade-off. Don't think how much money am I gonna make or how does this affect my reputation. Think about that most vulnerable person who could be using your product. How are they gonna be screwed over by that trade-off? These are the terms we need to be thinking about. This is why I really truly believe that we shouldn't be thinking about people and implementation details later while we concentrate on implementation and, and infrastructure and development tools first. Because if you give developers the tools, they will build stuff to screw people over. Very good at that. We need to reduce inequity and benefit democracy. We have to remember that democracy is not just everybody having a vote. In, a, in order for your vote to be meaningful, you have to be able to understand the implications of that vote. You have to have access to have that vote in the first place. You have to have the time and the privilege to learn about what that vote is and why it's important and how it might impact you before making an assessment. There's not that many people who are able to do that. I think that's probably reflected in the numbers that you have in the votes. We need to make things that are peer-to-peer, -peer, zero knowledge, and end-to-end -end encrypted as a basic. So once we have all of those things and we are respecting human rights, we can move on to the flesh of our fruit. So this is the bit that makes it really tasty. So it's making products that are functional, convenient, reliable, and accessible. Making products that actually work, who knew? So this is something that Silicon Valley is very good at doing, making products that work, that are very convenient, that you wanna use, that you know that they're gonna work in a reliable manner. And we need to be able to compete with that, with the alternatives to that technology. And accessibility. So I already talked about inclusivity in terms of making sure that your products work for people who are marginalized and disabled people. But who is your audience? Are you making another tool for a developer? Are you making nerd tools for nerds? Or are you making things that you want a mainstream audience to use? Think about them and design what you're building accordingly. So once we have all of these things, we're respecting human effort. These are the things we need to do to respect human effort in our products. And then we can move on to the skin, the presentation, the stuff that makes it all shiny. Things that make a product empowering, beautiful, because you do say that about stuff. Inspiring. You do say that about stuff too. And delightful. These are the things, the qualities that respect human experience. You're making something enticing. You're making something that people really want to use because it will empower them. We have to remember though that delight is not decoration. It is not Facebook's privacy dinosaur, which might look cute and is cutely convincing you to give all your data away. We're not talking about the Google Doodle on Google search, which looks so cultured and like they really know, like they care about humans when they're convincing you that they wanna take all your data. These things respect human experience. And once we, if we have products that have all this kind of shiny, beautiful things going on, often they can look this way on the outside. Things like the privacy dinosaur and the Google Doodle make a product look really appealing. But you don't want to take a bite out of that fruit because the inside of it is rotten. The human rights are not being respected. That core is rotten. So when we have our product and we are working on respecting human rights, respecting human effort, and respecting human experience, when we have all of those things together, and only when we have all of those things together, do we have ethical design. So when I come to events like this, people are like, well, I know how to maybe have a basic framework on how to make ethical products, 
But what about me as a person? I have to go out into this world. I have to try to interact with people who are not necessarily the same as me. What do I need to do? How do I actually make my approach more ethical? So number one, I think you need to listen. We need to diversify the sources of information we have. One of the reasons that we ended up building products that exploit people for so long is because we're looking around, we're, listening, we're looking at people who look like us, we're listening to what they say about technology, what they want from it, what benefits them, and we're going, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Pat on the back for you, pat on the back for you. We're all great, we build wonderful technology. We need to listen to people who are marginalized, the people who we can really screw over with our technology to make sure we don't do that. And we really, really need to listen to them and take it on board. We don't just need to go sit down, have a meeting with someone, listen to what they say, go away and do exactly what you were going to do anyway. And part of that is reading things that you might not normally, trying to be cynical about the world, teaching yourself stuff that you wouldn't necessarily pay attention to usually. I don't tend to give out reading lists and things like that because if you want to diversify your source material, following what I have is not really diverse. But these are two really good books that are a really good start for understanding the problem, particularly with bias in technology. Sarah Wachter-Betcher's Technically Wrong is fabulous. And Queer Privacy by Sarah Jamie Lewis is just got so much information about how we make things that work for people who are marginalized and people who we often screw over with our technology. And of course, um, I should probably promote my own book as well. <laughs> and actually, because it's relevant, if you build web technologies um, and work with them at all, my book talks about how we can make them particularly accessible to people with disabilities, but also to everyone. Uh, that's why it's called Accessibility for Everyone. Uh, and even if, you, if you're a developer or a designer or a writer, there's a bit in there for everyone as well. We need to introspect. So once we've taken in this information, we really have to question ourselves. We really have to say, am I doing the right thing? Have I picked the right technology? Have I just done it because I think it might be cool? It's very easy for us to justify our decisions after the fact. I do it all the time. Because you know what? Sometimes changing my mind, admitting I was wrong, eh, it could be quite tricky, makes you feel a bit, Ugh, don't want to admit that you weren't right. We need to be considering these things. We need to consider when we talk to people. I mean, for one, I'd really like it if men, particularly, in the tech industry would stop referring to their grandmothers and mothers as examples of people who can't use technology. It is sexist and it is ageist. We need to include people from marginalized groups in what we're doing. We should have more diverse teams. We should have people here that are from all different backgrounds. We should make sure that we're employing people like this. We shouldn't necessarily be employing people for the skills that they have right now. We're employing them for their perspective because anyone can develop technical skills if they are given the opportunity. We need to support these people. We need to bear in mind that existing on the planet today as a marginalized person is incredibly difficult, and even more so in an industry that, where you're not represented at all. So we have to support these people. And we need to elevate people. We need to elevate the most ethical ideas. We need to really support each other, and we need to be critical. We need to actually be able to say to each other, you know what, I think what you're doing could be dangerous. I think what we're doing could cause harm. And that's not overblowing it. Because we've seen how much with things like Facebook, you can cause a huge amount of harm. I want us all to be able to build the greatest alternative technology that we can, the most ethical technology that we can. And I think the only way we can do that is just really try. Thank you.